Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 599. Releasing April 12th in theaters across the US is Sweet Dreams, a dramatic comedy that stars Johnny Knoxville as Morris, a successful music director whose out-of-control alcoholism lands him in a sober living facility called Sweet Dreams. As part of his recovery, Morris takes on the role of softball coach for a team of misfit addicts contending for a major prize in an amateur tournament. Also starring Theo Vaughan, Bobby Lee and Kate Upton, Sweet Dreams hits that sweet spot between grounded drama, heartfelt comedy and underdog sports movie. And joining me now is the writer and director of Sweet Dreams, Mr. Lige Saki. Lige, how are you today? Good, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Well, it's great. It's great to have you here. And, you know, I, I watched Sweet Dreams a couple of nights ago, and I have so many questions to ask about this film. <laughs> um, I did as much uh, background as I could just on on, on yourself in the movie. Um, so, um, am I correct in that? So, four years ago, you pick up a friend of yours from like a, a like a sober living facility, kind of similar to a Sweet Dreams, and from that point, that's where you kind of have the the idea or the germ or idea of kind of making a movie in that kind of a facility like that. What was it about? Um, your mate's circumstance and also regarding the whole sober living experience I really said to you, you know, this is something that I think I can, I can work with and create something here. Yeah. I mean, I think the idea came just a little bit before that, you know, I I'd watched a, f- a film that I really enjoyed and thought it was a great movie, uh, but I, it didn't like have that look of recovery that I've, you know, I feel like I kept seeing these repeat drab, depressing looks at like, sobriety alcoholism whatever you know and it's a tough thing and i think i had that in the back of my hand shortly before picking up my friend from that sober living that god it'd be nice to show this in a different light and um and then i was like always wanted to make a baseball movie i th- and i had been thinking about that too this was um you know i think also shortly a couple months maybe prior to picking my friend up that day and then when i picked him up i don't know if it was that day when i picked him up but it was at some point we were talking i was like this would be a good setting for this idea really and uh but yeah that's that's the beginning but it was slightly before that just in a way of like it's been kind of percolating a bit about just trying to take a different look at this subject matter that i've never seen done in a way that's like more fun like more real really like if it was terrible i wouldn't do it you know (laughs) if it was not a good time i I would have i would have never went stayed sober you know so um just trying to bring the light to that to the subject a little bit you know, I've heard you uh, say that before, and I was really curious, how much does movies and pop culture affect the ways people view not only sobriety, but the the methods to get the sobriety? Um, do potential um, people who might go into the sober facilities, are they, are they turned off by like depictions of what sobriety is and how it's depicted in movies and shows? I think, you know, for me, I, I when I grew up, you know, my dad got sober when I was growing up, so I knew what it was. I had a different impression of it. I didn't, wasn't attracted to what he did at all. You know, what he had done looked to me like it was the end of my life. You know, this looked terrible. And my experience is not that, you know, so I think you, the only experience you have is what you've seen, whether it's somebody close to you or not. And I I know a lot of guys that have gotten sober that had no idea that there was this whole world, like they didn't even know it exists. So, um, yeah, I think you pick it up wherever you see it, whether it's, you know, someone, you know, and you, and you create an idea of that for yourself pretty quickly of what it is. And it's just a perspective. And it, if it's wrong, you know, it could my idea of thinking that getting sober, my life was going to be over, kept me out of getting sober for 20 years. You know, like I knew as a teenager, I was like, yep, I got a, I got that thing my dad had, but I'm mm. not going there like that. What am I going to do if I have to stop drinking? Like My life will be over, you know? So, right. yeah, I think you just make up what based off whatever you're watching seeing your friends family whatever that is so when it comes to kind of like partnering the 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 baseball movie with the story about this this man going through sobriety um it's really interesting to me how sports plays a really pivotal role when it comes to people in recovery um in recovery of all kind of all different all different types um i was talking to um a director who used to be actually a former um uh, nfl player um, Nate Boyer, he did a film called MVP uh, a few years ago, and that movie was about um, veterans um, and how when they came back from the war, and a lot of them kept succumbed to homelessness, alcoholism, addictions, etc. And his movie depicted how 
um, they came together to create this um, uh, kind of like a, a training facility, UFC um, MMA training facility, and how that kind of helped a lot of people um, with their addictions because it gave them not only community, but it gave them purpose as well. Um, the married uh, baseball in your in your movie kind of has that as well. It does not only gives like a, a, a thing about teamwork, but it talks about uh, a purpose. There's a certain purpose behind them playing baseball. Um, um, you know, was baseball always the number one thing you had in mind in regards to that avenue, that kind of um, uh, activity to kind of um, not only distract uh, the the people who, who who were dealing with addiction, but also gave them kind of like a lifeline of sorts um, to really focus on um, while, you know, going through the hard, the hard times of um, recovery? Yeah, I think, I mean, you said it, it's community and it's teamwork and it's working. Together. It's like outside of just like the idea, the idea of the work to be sober seems you know, like a lot of not fun stuff, you know, so it's, you, it could have been a bowling team. It would have worked probably similarly. You know, I just like was a baseball fan. I've been a baseball fan for a while and um, it just felt like the right setup, you know, the bad news bears is, been you know, if you can make it just a decent, you know, baseball movie, it's fun to watch. And I was like, how come the teams never, I feel like there's been a streak of people losing at the end and I was like can mm -hmm. they just win again at the end you know so I just right. I kind of went back to this old it's almost formulaic in a way that's just not exciting but we tried to make it exciting but you know you kind of know what's going to happen but um yeah I don't know it, it just like it, it gets you out of yourself when you're when you're playing you know you're not focused on you anymore so it makes life more enjoyable enjoyable you know and you're out there to help each other and to team sport, right? There's no, there's a little ego involved, but um, I don't know. It felt like a good, good setup for it, but I didn't have it in mind when I, it, that's what happened when I picked my friend up and I was like, Oh, what would be good? A baseball, right? There's a lot of people, <laughs> you know, you need a group and uh, yeah, it just felt right. I didn't think of football or anything. Plus football felt harder, you know, and softball versus baseball, like anybody can play softball. So there's no real like skill level. You can be terrible and still, it still counts. Like, it's just as much fun, I thought, watching people play terribly than it was to watch them play great, you know? It's just, it's funnier, actually, so. Please support Matt's movie reviews on Patreon. Get access to exclusive content, request movie reviews and top 10 lists, and help support my work. Please click on the Patreon link in the description below. And, and forgive me if I'm wrong about this, something I've always read about with people who go through sobriety is about the amount of time they have in their hands, time that would have been occupied maybe uh, drinking or doing whatever else. And yeah. softball or baseball is a notoriously long game, so I'm sure having that time uh, dedicated to something uh, helps a lot as well. Yeah, it's just you don't want to sit by yourself ever, really. <laughs> so mm -hmm. just being in action and hanging out with people is, yeah, and baseball is a long game, you're right. Well, softball game's not that long. It's like an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. But but yeah, I mean, the more time you're doing stuff, hanging out with other people, the less you're thinking about yourself and how shitty your life is, you know? So it's it's good for it's good for that. Um, Johnny Knoxville, how um soon was he uh, a part of the process here? Because I know um he has his own life experiences as well in regards to sobriety. So um did you know of him beforehand? Was, this, was he someone you had in mind for the movie? How did he kind of become part of the process of um, Sweet Dreams? No, you know, we started putting the cast, I started putting the cast together early on in the process, like after I had an early draft, you know, with just some people that I knew. Um, but the cast changed quite a bit over trying to put it together for first year and a half. And it was more a matter of people just kind of fell in and out based off schedule stuff. And I, and I had an opportunity at this, uh, you know, a time probably four months before, like a window opened up and I was like, who could this be? And, and, you know, I had worked with um, this guy, Albert Berger, who I produced peanut butter Falcon with. He, he had always talked about Johnny Knoxville, Johnny Knoxville, because he, he wanted Johnny in that movie. He was like, he's a serious actor. Like, you know, people don't know that. And I, it's just always stuck with me. And I, and I try to, you know, when I think about cast, I really always try to think about the unexpected person. I just think it's more interesting. And that felt unexpected in a way that like he's known for comedy more. I know him more for comedy and the movie's supposed to be funny, but his role is not funny. His role is like, it's very serious. You know, the movie's not really funny. I mean, it's, it's not jokes. It's just the funny comes from the absurdity and the, and the banter, you know, and the, and the making fun of each other. And, but for the Knoxville Carrick Morris, it was, 
it was a very serious role and some and i just hadn't seen johnny do i was like that could be cool that could be really interesting you know and um you know he, he really responded strongly to it it was great you know and i had a couple friends that were close to him like and i talked to them and was like you think he would do that you know that kind of whole back channel thing and and um i was really hopeful and he responded so it, it was like it was really cool how it worked out and it was not what i thought of when i was writing it you know that's the whole that's the thing so uh, uh, an excellent surprise. Um, speaking of excellent surprise, the opening of the movie, I love um, character introductions. I like some, there's some great character in the cinema and the introduction of Morris to us, where he's at his lowest, sleeping on a park bench, woken up by someone's dog, bloodied face. Um, you know something's like very wrong going on here with this guy. Um, how did you come up with that idea to open the film in that way where we're meeting him at his lowest ebb? And how would, did you come up with the idea that that would be for him uh, the lowest ebb um, for this character, for him to start his trajectory? I don't know how that specific idea came to mind. I don't remember any, but I've just, I've woken up like that. You know, I've woken up. You know what? I do know. So this is a personal story, but I, I was with my family over a holiday once and I went out to a bar and I, and I think I ended up peeing on somebody's, shoe in the in the bathroom mm. and i went outside and they they knocked me out and i don't remember i woke up in a dog bed with a black and blue face not like john and Le the morris woke up but i i woke up and didn't know how that happened you know and it that's what inspired it's like all this is personal stuff you know it's been a long time since i've since i've had a drink so i can go back and i can laugh at this stuff now um but yeah i mean <laughs> i put myself in sim similar situations over and over, you know, so, and then you have enough friends that have all been in those kind of situations too. And it's, you know, hopefully it's, it's laughable now, but um, yeah. And the interesting thing about the character of, of Morris is that, and we are reminded throughout the movie that when it comes to addiction, when it comes to alcoholism, it isn't a, a class problem. It isn't a wealth problem. It's a people problem. Um, and the interesting thing about his character is that he's a very successful man. He's a very successful, you know, music director. <clears throat> the character that Jay Moore plays in the movie is also a very successful man as well. <clears throat> so really what it comes down to, I think, that I take away from this film is that no matter who you are, no matter what role you play in life, this thing can grab you, uh, can grab anyone, and you can't buy your way out of it. You have to work from the inside out. That's something that really grabbed me uh, when I watched it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Um, I want to... And well, is that something that you've had experience with as well? Or have you seen a lot of kind of like, I'm not, I'm not asking the name names, but, you know, I imagine you've seen people that you thought maybe could be untouchable to, to really succumb to this kind of stuff. I don't know. I'm not surprised by it anymore. I've just seen, you know, there's a such a variety of people that, you know, so this Kate Upton's character has that line that says misery doesn't care what you look like. And, it, and yeah. I think it it rings true for anybody. Like it doesn't matter who you are. And it, it's fun. You get surprised a lot by pe you think people that have it all materially, you know, just feel empty inside. And, and I think it's, you know, when you're trying to get your value and, and your self-worth from out there, it's really hard, you know, um, and it doesn't work. So what I've learned is like, it has to be here first, you know, and then it doesn't matter what you have materially. So, um, I'm more happy than I've ever been in my life. And I've, I probably have a lot less than a, a lot of other folks that you'd think are happier. So, um, yeah, the simplicity is what, what attracts me. And I think a, a lot of guys that have, you know, gotten sober and they understand that, you know, just sort of the same way I do. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by T Public. T Public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, T Public is sure to have something you will love. The thing I loved about uh, Johnny's performance in the movie is um, the his portrayal of vulnerability in the movie. Um, AA meetings in the movie, like the meetings in the film, that's something that's always you always come back to the meetings all the time because it's all about you know opening yourself up and being vulnerable and such. And the thing I find interesting about Johnny Knoxville is that for so long, especially, for, say, for my generation who woke, who grew up watching Jackass and such, he's almost kind of like, in other guys in that clique, you know, Steve-O and such, are almost kind of like immortal figures, but to see them going through these feats of pain and torture and stuff that they, they place on themselves and st still stand up surviving at the end. Um, but they, are, they aren't immortal. They are like everyone else. 
Um, and while they may walk away from like you know crashing a uh, shopping cart into a you know a, 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 a you know a, a parked car or something, uh, when it comes to a lot of other things, uh, they can't walk away from it. You know, it's something that they have to really work on. Um, and getting Johnny to show those vulnerabilities, especially in his AA scenes, I think it might take people a little a back a bit because not only does it show his dramatic chops, um, but it shows that you know this guy has got something to say emotionally. Because so much of his stuff has been physical before. That's how I mean I was a storyteller. So what was it like doing those AA meetings to kind of get in having him just kind of tap into that deep world I'm sure he has within him and kind of express those emotions on, on camera uh the way that he does in Sweet Dreams. Yeah, I mean, well, when we first met, he 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 let me know that this was very personal for him. You know, he really related to this. And whether that was like to his first degree of him or a friend or whoever, you know, I don't want to speak for him, but, you know, he didn't have a problem going there, you know, from the first take, it was, it was like that, you know? Um, so, I mean, to, I don't want to speak for him, but I've heard him say it enough over the last few days that, you know, it was very personal. It's very personal to him, you know, and, and there's some scenes in the movie where he reads, uh, where he's talking about his daughter and, and in those scenes, he would, his, uh, his daughter worked on the movie with us. So she would read the scenes with him off camera, those ones. And man, it just hit him every time. It just hit him, you know, in a way that's just like very powerful. When it came to the casting of the supporting players, something that's really interesting. And I, and I wanted to see if this was something that evolved naturally or was intentional, the casting of comics in a movie, um, you got Bobby Lee, you got Theo Vaughn, you know, we talked about uh, Jane Moore as well and a, and a bunch of others as well. Um, and I know with Bobby Lee and Theo Vaughn, they have spoken on their podcast about their own journeys and such when it comes to this stuff. Um, so how much was it intentional that you wanted to get these guys in these roles or, how, or was it just something that kind of changed as you were speaking before the casting changed over, over the years and it's something that where, hey man, let's, you know, Bobby might be good in this role, Theo might be good in this role. I mean, how does that kind of work out where all these comics kind of uh, assemble for your movie? You know, the, so the Theo role, the Garvey role, I, I had him in mind early on. So when I asked him if he would do it, he I had already like I felt like I was trying to write it for him. Um, so I got really lucky with with him wanting to be involved. And then, um, you know, Jake, the the character in the movie is a surfer guy. Right. And when I first the first you know few drafts he was he could surf really well and all this and I was and I was watching the show Dave at the time and I was like god the gate is great man I had to get that guy in the movie and so I just changed the role a little bit and approached Gata hey would you want to do this and you know it was a weird situation because there's a lot I, I went to a lot of people specifically and a lot <laughs> I would say most of them responded very well to it so it, it, I don't know I, I feel like everybody has like a personal connection to this kind of a thing I really do. I feel like everybody, whether that's your family member or a friend, you know, somebody that struggled. So people related more when than it comes to more than I'm used to, you know, happening. And so a lot of people that I asked kind of said yes. And then it would shift, you know, people's schedules change and I would have to go to someone else. But it was still it was, a, you know, I went to a lot of people that I know first. Um, when you have that many comics in the one uh, one movie. How much does improvisation kind of come up? Do they add little kind of bits and, and bobs into their in processes or because we're dealing with an indie project? Also, I imagine you were filming this maybe during COVID conditions as well. I'm not sure about the timing. Um, is there no time to kind of explore in that kind of way? Yeah, no, we, they definitely explored, you know, a lot of the softball, they had more freedom because it was less scripted. You know, it was more plays. Like we have to do this play, this play. So they were just riffing all the time out there. And, and it's just funny. They just give each other such a hard time. Um, but then, you know, we'd have those eight person scenes, 10 person scenes, and we just try really hard to get it and be like, okay, we got it. And then we'd screw around, you know, um, and they make the most of screwing around. It doesn't take a lot. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's a lot of improv impro improvisation in the movie. Um, but we, we did a good job of getting the scripted version as well. So. Where do I mean, you find they're just funny, funny to watch hang out, you know? So uh, Theo said it early on. He's like, you just point the camera at Bobby and it and it's great, you know? And we did that, point the camera at Bobby and he's he's just so funny in the movie, you know? And and Theo's so funny, just naturally so funny. And 
and Gator was so good. Mo was so good at being like this grounding force in the in the home. And then Kate was awesome. And Jay Moore was like a huge surprise. Like mm. not for me. Like I knew Jay was gonna kill it. And I went to Jay and and um everybody's just like so impressed with Jay. And I don't know. I'm so happy with how all the cast showed up and and, and turned out. Where do you find the house itself, Sweet Dreams? Is that an actual facility? Or was that something that you found just for the movie? How did that come out? Come about to find that place? Yeah, uh, do I tell you the secret? Oh, by the way, Amy Renee, who helped me cast a lot of the movie too, she should be congratulated. Um, but yeah, that's a house that this is six feet under house. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. The I very first that. house we looked at. And I was like, I don't want to use a house that's already been in stuff, you know, whatever. And we just couldn't find something as good. So we ended up going back to that house. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by Amazon Prime Video. One of the best on-demand streaming services available, Amazon Prime Video features exclusive Amazon originals as well as popular movies and TV shows. Watch Amazon Prime Video anytime, anywhere. Oh, that's cool. All right. When it comes to the house dynamic, um, like I said, a misfit group of addicts, and they all kind of got their own little quirks, their own little personalities. Um, how much of that is in the script? How much is that is that um, the cast themselves, who are strong personalities in their own right, kind of bring the rank kind of little little thing to to these um, to these roles? Yeah, I feel like everybody plays a version of themselves, you know, in the movie. I don't think. I mean, I don't know that Knoxville's ever that serious in his real life. You know, I've spent a little bit of time with him. So that was maybe something that he definitely something that he is not naturally always like that. Like he's a more positive dude. Um, but yeah, I mean, Mo is is more grounded in the movie maybe than he is in real life in just a way that he's such a lighter personality and, and, and more jokes and fun. But I don't know. I feel like everybody's kind of got a version of themselves going on in there. I, I, I tried to cast that way, like except for like what I was saying earlier about Knoxville. It's like, I don't know if I've seen him in something like this, but like Gata, just be Gata, you know, um, Bobby, just be Bobby, Theo, be Theo, um, Jay, be Jay. Yeah. I just, you know, my DP had, 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 had told me about dumbfounded that, you know, uh, John, Johnny Park, who's in the movie and he's just him, you know? So a lot, yeah, most people played, not that they played themselves. They're still sitting there having, you know, doing their thing but um we cast in a way that it the movie plays like a version of real life in a way so it's cool just on that note in regards to the real life aspect it feels very documentary to me um I, and i think in a lot of ways the way that you use your camera a lot of handheld there are scenes i think the one scene that really stood out for me um it was a small thing maybe just because of the, my movie nerd brain um, the scene where uh, Morris first goes out to hit and you're following the camera, you have it following him all the way out there. Um, how much of your style has developed over the years where you kind of have that kind of more documentary kind of uh, uh, style to your feature films? Because I know you've I, you've done documentaries before as well. Am I, am I correct? Or is it just feature I've films? I've worked on some before? documentaries. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. you know, the big documentary. Uh, no, I think everything ends up being different. Like the same DP, seeing how uh, Yam, who... I've worked with multiple times at this point. There's another another movie I did prior to this that's not out yet. Completely different. Um, shot completely different. Same DP, same director, same writer. That's like a kind of a thriller. Um, and, it, you know, Singh brings a ton to the table because I'm just like, this is how I want it to feel. And he, he, like, I didn't go to film school. I've learned by doing it over and over. And I just don't know shit. And uh, so I really lean on him and I'm like, this is how I want to feel. This is what I'm thinking. These are some other movies that I like. And so he'll come up with a plan and we work together, but I lean on him more than anything, you know, and that one or that you're talking about, that was his idea. I didn't have that idea. So he's like, I have an idea here. How would you like this? I'm like, this would be sick if it worked. And it worked. And it took us like, Johnny was so concerned about his hit, you know, mm -hmm. we had it more than once early on, but we wanted Johnny to have his, his hit, but um yeah, that one worked. I, I love that that shot. Yeah, I like that shot too. It was something that really kind of stuck to me because just to see him kind of, because uh, at first he didn't want to hit, right? And then he's like, okay, i got to do this thing. And he kind of like walks out there. I, I really I really dug that as well. Um, you mentioned a line 
in the movie that I really liked, which is the one that um, Kate Upton says, which was um, "Misery doesn't care what you look like." Um, this is a great, this is a very quotable movie. This one because there's some great dialogue. One of my favorite ones as well, which I had written on here: uh, "Focus on negative shit, you get negative shit," which is just it's it's simple in its logic, but it's also kind of like profound in a way that people don't think that way. You know, you know, because I think especially. Yeah. These days, people just focus on negative shit. How much of those kind of um, those quotes, though, that though, the the life advice stuff that's in the movie, how much of that is something that you learnt over the years in regards to uh, your uh, your rec recovery, your sobriety, uh, your evolution as, as a person? Is that kind of stuff that you learn and you just wanted to to share that with the world in, in this script? Yeah, I mean, it's all stuff that I've learned, and that's exactly what I was trying to do. Um, the 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 focus on negative shit. You know, I heard a guy um for like five years into my recovery talk about focusing on the things that work in your life you know not the things that don't and I spent the whole first five years of my recovery trying to fix my life and fix and fix fix all the broken things and instead of and I heard that and I was like it changed my whole perspective on the whole thing and it blew my mind and it and it made everything so much better and I started to look at my wife at all the, you know, beautiful things she's doing instead of like how the dishwasher's loaded the wrong way or the toilet paper's flipped over backwards mm -hmm. and like start ignoring that shit, you know, and focus on how great she is as a mom and how she reads to my kid at night and how I don't do that, you know, and and, and just all the, the positives. And I try to take that into my life and, you know, and walk on the sunny side of the street and, and it can sound kooky and hokey and whatever, but it's it's man, I was always trying to like make it myself and everyone around me be this perfect version so I could feel good. And instead of like, no, no, you just have to let go of all that and, and focus on the stuff that works. And so, yeah, every all the little things in there are all stuff I picked up here and there that I, you know, that have worked or stuff that doesn't work. I'm, that's also stuff that's in there, too, that I don't, you know, so. And well, I just don't hear that stuff talked about much, you know, in the recovery side of things. And I, I yeah. think it's important to to at least have that option of a viewpoint to explore. You know, I'm not here to tell people how or what to do by any means at all. I just want to try to show some light instead of the dark, if if it's possible, you know. And, it's a, and you do it in a great way. And, and I, I really appreciate because that quote about um, focusing on, on negative shit, I think it's something that's really stuck with me as well. I think it's something I'm going to take with me going forward. Because in my, in my household with my, my kids and my family, we have a thing where we don't believe in perfection. It's nothing doesn't exist. And um, the saying um, practice is per uh, practice is perfect. We change that to our house, which is practice is progress. You know, the more you do stuff, you're progressing, but you're never going to achieve perfection because it's unachievable, uh, in my opinion, anyway. Um, so everyone out there listening, April 12, Sweet Dreams, and I believe is also going to be a uh, digital release uh, a few days after that. But I encourage everyone to watch this in cinemas because we yeah. need um, films like this to be seen in cinemas. The more people watch movies like Sweet Dreams in cinemas, um, the more we get more movies like Sweet Dreams in cinemas. It's really important that people do uh, do that. And um, I'm just going to say, uh, Lee Saki, thank you so very much for your time today. Thanks for your movie. Um, it's uh, great stuff you've done here. The, in the may, way that you managed to bring all these different elements together, and like I said, hit that sweet spot between all of them. It's a really great job here. And um, congrats on the film. Congrats. Uh, good luck in the film's release. And hopefully... Uh, we talk again in the future. It's been it's been a pleasure. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Matthew, Matt. I don't know which one to go by, but I appreciate Either it. Either one. Okay. Have a good one. You too. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content.